So we'll continue talking about the uh, particular cartilage. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay. Um, so it looks like there is a full thickness focal cartilage defect right in the kind of medial trochlea overlying the patellar ridge, and it looks like it's fairly long on the sagittal image. And is this this? Is it later? So this is 4108. Okay, so 4108, and then this is. Uh, two years later, a little more than two years later. So now it looks like they're. It looks like the chondral defect is now larger, involving kind of the central trochlea, and then there looks like there's on the sagittal there's been formation of kind of a subchondral osteophyte. So, just to show that these subchondral osteophytes, uh, that they really develop over time, and again, it's again it's the bone healing response that we've talked about before. So here we can see there's no osteophyte there. Here we have an acute tear of the articular cartilage of the uh, medial trochlea. And following it over time, after surgery, we can see the development of the subchondral osteophyte, which indicates a chronic injury to the, to the articular cartilage with an attempted healing. And uh, this is just a paper that looked at the subchondral osteophytes and just shows that uh, uh, they're affiliated with de chronic degenerative changes and they of themselves don't tend to be symptomatic. And here's some more subchondral osteophytes developing in areas of uh, degenerative disease of the articular cartilage. And let me see here. Uh, let me see. Okay, here's a T1 coronal. Here's a PD fat set. They're kind of thick. And here we can see also a lot of cartilage disease, but I don't really see subchondral osteophytes. Here's a PD sequence. Uh, and then here's a T2 sequence. But then if we go to the cube, the thinner cut images, and we go through this area, we can actually start seeing a uh, subchondral osteophyte that we really couldn't see. It was right between two thicker cut images. So again, some of these smaller things you can see better with the thin cuts. It's looking at the cube. So uh, grading chondromalacia. Uh, the, the standard classification system that almost everybody tends to use is the outer bridge classification, where we have it's really an arthroscopic classification based on grades one, two, three, and four. One is discoloration and softening, uh, where you probe it, it's a soft area. Two, you have surface erosion. Three, you have deep fissures, but you can't see the underlying bone. In grade four, you can see the underlying bone is being exposed. So when you talk about uh, grades of cartilage, this is really the, the, the typical uh, criteria that's used. and uh, I think traditionally this is primarily for more chronic degenerative change like chondromalacia rather than acute injuries, <laughs> but it can be used in both. People have tried to come up with uh, uh, more refined uh, grading criteria, especially for research purposes, and we may, may want to use some of these in the research projects that we may be doing. Uh, that this. Uh, later this year with, with Cedars and Curl and Job. Uh, so another one is the ICRS classification. Again, this is also arthroscopic. Uh, here they grade, they change one into one, uh, A and B, fibrillation or softening, uh, laceration with small fissures, grade two are defects, but they're less than 50% thickness, grade three are defects greater than 50% in thickness, and grade four shows exposed bone. So it's, it's very similar to the outer bridge classification. Uh, I, th I, th I would think it would be difficult arthroscopically to, to differentiate just exactly what percentage of thickness is involved. It can. Another classification system that's out there is the Osteoarthritis Research Society International Classification, the ORSI classification. 
Grade zero is the surface is intact. Grade one surface is intact, but you have edema and thickening with maybe softening. Grade two is surface discontinuity. Grade three are vertical fissures. Grade four are larger erosions. Five, denudation. And six, you have deformity of the, of the underlying bone. Here's the worms classification, the whole organ magnetic resonance imaging score. Let's see, who, let me just see who joined us. Hi, Ashu. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me just go back briefly. We're just talking about classification system of achondromalacia. What we typically use is the outer bridge classification, uh, which you see here was arthroscopic. Then there's the ICRS classification that just divides one in uh, grade one into fibrillation or lacerations, superficial lacerations. And then grades two and three would be less than 50% or greater than 50% thickness or exposed bones. But most people, when they just grade it, they're using the outer bridge classification. Then there's an ORC classification, which uh, a lot of the uh, osteoarthritis groups are trying to use now to refine it a little bit better. And then we're just getting to the worms classification. Uh, <clears throat> Here, grade zero is normal thickness and signal intensity on MR. A grade one abnormality is increased signal intensity on T2. Grade two is partial thickness focal defects. And then grade 2.5 is full thickness focal defects. Grade three, multiple areas of partial thickness. Four is diffuse partial thickness loss. Five, multiple areas of full thickness loss. And six is diffuse full thickness loss. Uh, so uh, that's really trying to grade the, the whole Articular cartilage of a, of a compartment of the a bony compartment. And we can't stop there. There's the Mokes classification, MRI osteoarthritis knee score, where you score the size uh, as a percentage of the cartilage surface and then the amount of loss or the thickness loss. So this is a, uh, this was published in 2011. Uh, we've, so, uh, again, we typically, most people just use the outer bridge classification when they talk about grades 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, uh, and then we already talked about this paper yesterday where it shows if you have any signal changes or uh, with or inhomogeneity, focal low signal, inhomogeneous signal, uh, the increased signal intensity on PD fat set, or thickening and with or without subchondral bone marrow edema. All of these over time, if you follow them from two years, tend to create focal defects. So any of these signal abnormalities are significant findings and are, are, are increased risk for cartilage loss. Okay, let's see. Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so I guess we're looking at the patella here. Um, almost looks like there's a very, either a very shallow patella. It almost looks like um, there's not much of a concavity to the patella. Um, just looking, I don't know if we're pretty high up. I don't really it's see very, much. It's not very V-shaped, and if you go to the to the trochlear, you'll find that there's a shallow trochlear groove. Mm -hmm. So what about the cartilage? Looks like it's. I mean, it looks okay. There's is there some signal uh, changes of the patellar cartilage and some fraying. Yeah, it should be perfectly smooth. This yep. is normal surface. This is very abnormal surface. Uh, but this would is typically would be described arthroscopically as grade two. You have fissures, but they're not very deep. Uh, and, and involve involving the articular cartilage. Grain one would be increased signal intensity or increased thickness of the articular cartilage with increased signal intensity, but an intact surface. Grade two, the surface is irregular. Uh, and so that this would be grade two. And then, uh, as you said, uh, you, you do not have a very deep V-shape to the patella. And if you go up and look at the trochlea, it's a very shallow trochlear groove. So this patient has some uh, anterior compartment dysplasia, which led them to get developing the chondromalacia.
So 53-year-old female with medial knee pain for six months and a documented meniscal tear. Um, looking here, it seems that the articular surface along the central weight-bearing portion of the joint appears intact, but there is some high-grade chondral loss along the far posterior non-weight-bearing surface of that femoral condyle, probably grade three to four chondral loss, and grade one signal in the articular surface of the patella, and there we can see a deep partial thickness fissure. Using the thicker cuts, maybe a little signal abnormality, but it's hard to see with the thinner cuts. You can clearly see the effect. Cannot hear you well, John. Okay. Hello. Hi, John. Hi. And there we can see the deep fissuring in the articular cartilage there. And this was grade three at arthroscopy. Okay, so um, looks we have some abnormal signal in the um, central femoral, like the lateral femoral condyle cartilage. It looks probably like a full thickness fissure, and there's probably but there's not really an, anything in the subchondral bone. Um, this is just showing some more, probably like some full thickness fissure in along the femoral condyle. This is what the uh, normal articular cartilage should look like, nice and smooth arthroscopically here. And on the, this side, this is what it looked like uh, arthroscopically. So if you go back and try to compare, this is what this is on a one Tesla scanner. We can see these areas of, of thinning with cartilage, this irregularity of the surface all across here. What that looks like arthroscopically are these areas here. Uh, the lesions are much larger, usually arthroscopically, than than they are um, uh, on MRI. At least that's what uh, I've read. Yeah, and then, uh, well, it, it depends upon the technique. Yeah, the, there's a tendency for MR to underestimate the size of lesions, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, the reason for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think later in this lecture, uh, and then, uh, but uh, you obviously have much higher spatial resolution at arthroscopy than you have with MR, and uh, that is very, very helpful in looking at a lot of these kind of surface lesions. Uh, and this was graded as a outer bridge three at arthroscopic imaging. Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um. Looks did, like did they, uh, John, excuse me. Uh, did they say uh, whether they use a system of four or three? Uh, uh, we we just went through the different grading systems. John. Oh, I, I'm sorry. When, when did you start? So, I, I sent an email. We we had to start at two forty-five today. Oh, I'm, I I didn't. Get, I, I guess I didn't look at the. Uh, I'm sorry, John. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, so the, 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 let me briefly go back through those just for a second. The 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 class the one that we typically use most people use is the outer bridge classification, which is right. four. Uh, and then there's an ICRS classification, which is five, but but they're basically similar to outer bridge, but they divide grade one into two different types. And then uh, there's an ORSI classification that's six. A worms classification that really has uh, eight, and then there's a Mox classification, which class separately classifies the size and the amount of uh, loss of articular cartilage in the joint. Uh, I, I used to use I used to use three. Okay. Yeah. So back here. So we've been using we typically use the outer bridge classification, which would be four. Uh, well, that's fine. I mean, because later on, 
in life um, uh, four became the more common one okay yeah but as you and i say all the time we'd prefer to describe it and say its significance rather than giving a classification because as we can see here there are many different classifications that have been published and grade three and one is different from grade three and another one so it can become very confusing if uh, you and the people who read your report aren't on the same page Jennifer, what do you think of this one? So, do you want to take it? Sure. Um, just looking at the medial patellar facet, there's this looks like there's almost complete um, chondral loss there. I would say grade three or four, um, near near grade four of that medial patellar facet there. This is the axial. This is what it looks like on the sagittal. Wow. Um, you, you kind of almost completely miss it. You see a deep fissure on, on one slice, but the other slice is completely nor almost normal. Yeah. Now, if we go through the, the, the cube sequences, it looks like this. There's one cut, there's another cut, there's another cut, there's another cut, there's another cut. So on the... Uh, uh, Oh, this is a, this is actually a different patient. I'm sorry. And uh, here's the lesion in the axial plane. So it it, it just shows that uh, sometimes with three millimeter thick cuts, three millimeter skip, uh, ten or ten or twenty percent. Uh, sometimes these relatively large lesions can look smaller because you may see them only on one cut. So you have to look in multiple different planes. And uh, uh, hopefully, eventually, we'll be able to go to more three D imaging where spatial resolution will be less of a problem. And so we, we could see this lesion on the sagittal images on only two cuts when we did the standard three millimeter thick images, but we saw it on nine cuts on the 1.6 non-skip uh, contiguous images. Okay. All right, well, we have a 41-year-old female with anterior knee pain these are fat sat GRE images, and typically we can't see the articular surfaces as well with GRE images. I do see a focus of edema-like marrow signal intensity in the medial patellar facet, so I would be concerned there's some fissuring. And here we can see on T2 we have much better spatial resolution, and she has full thickness or grade four chondral fissuring within both the medial patellar facets and median ridge with some adjacent marrow edema. I was going to say, I'm not sure that was grade four. Right, so this was, this was grade three. They're deep fissures, but they, they, they really didn't expose them. Although it's, it's possible that uh, a cut, uh, cut one way or the other uh, may may show a four. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was the the cut that showed it the worst areas. Okay, here here we can see now. This is an arthroscopic image of an osteochondral injury. Here, this was a 10 10 uh, 98, and then it was debreeded. And when you debreed, you can still see a lot of irregularities of the surface. Very large lesion with a lot of irregularity of the subchondral bone. Uh, this is with the tourniquet. Uh, blown up so that you don't get bleeding in the knee. Uh, when you let up the tourniquet, you can see bleeding in this particular area. This was actually after a microfracture technique, uh, and that's the bleeding that can occur after the microfracture technique uh, here. And uh, here's what we see. This is uh, 99, uh, and this is now uh, almost five, five, something like five or six years later. And we can see this is after a microfracture technique. And now, uh, a number of years later, we can actually see what looks like maybe cartilage there, but we need to look at uh, other images. Here is uh, here's the stir images. This was on a 0.3 Tesla scanner at that time, a 1 Tesla scanner at this time. Uh, but this was all fluid going all the way down to the bone. And after the microfracture technique, even though we have a lot of irregularity of the subconnor bone here, you can see that there's actually... Uh, cartilage intact here f uh, f over five years after the microfracture technique uh, occurred. This tends to be more fibrocartilage. If you do T2 mapping on it, you don't get the gradation 
of glucosaminoglycans in it because it's predominantly fibrocartilage, not uh, true normal articular cartilage, but it still can can uh, be functional uh, with the microfracture technique. So, uh, and here you, we'll talk about treatment protocols later, and we'll come back to this when we talk about what with lubrication and, and there being car, uh, cartilage over the bone, uh, you're going to have a lot better um, function and uh, uh, fewer symptoms. Yeah, great. What, what's microfracture? Okay. Uh, I'll talk about it uh, later. You, you basically uh, punch little holes in the subchondral bones, allow bleeding into the area. Let's, well, I'll go back. Might as well talk about it now. We'll talk about it again when we get to treatment protocols. So here's the lesion before it's debrided. Uh, here is the lesion after it's, uh, while it's in the process of being debrided, but when the tourniquet is still up, and then you just put, put, puncture little holes into the subchondral bone here, and then when you let up on the tourniquet, it allows blood flow to the knee, and so you can see him uh, bleeding in the area where you did the microfracture to the underlying bone. And then it uh, cleaned out a little bit here. That's kind of what's left when they closed. And then what happens here is uh, uh, initially there was no cartilage after uh, around the time of debridement. But five years later, we can see that there is some uh, fibrocartilage intact here uh, that developed after the microfracture. A lot of people believe it's uh, bone marrow stem cells that come out, dedifferentiate, and produce a, a kind of an acting cartilage. This was. So that's one of the standard techniques that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, Michael. Okay, so we see some, uh, maybe some abnormal signal in the lateral tibial cartilage, but no, I don't see like a, like a fissure defect, but I'd want to see some so other cuts. So that's T1. Mm -hmm. Here's the stir. So on the stir, we do see, um, Kind of a full thickness defect with underlying subchondral marrow edema. And this was great for there, good. Uh, Ashi, what do you think of this case? So anteriorly um, uh, at the tr uh, lateral trochlea, we see a full thickness chondral defect and some um, hibernation, some uh, changes of the subchondral. Uh, trabecular bone there, and, uh, and and yeah, we see a little bit of edema there as well. Okay, so this is 9-11-2012. It came in with anterior knee pain, and this is now 1-18-13. Uh, looks like it's, um, well, I don't know if it's delaminated or torn off the remaining cartilage of the lateral trochlea. Um, you can see maybe uh, a loose loose. Loose chondral lesion is that on, on along the medial patellar facet? Looks like there's some. So let's go back. Oops, sorry about that. So let's start over here. Again. Okay, so here, uh, this was kind of a subacute injury, but you can see a full thickness focal defect as you talked about with some subchondral uh, hibernation and some granulation tissue and marrow edema uh, underlying uh, uh, the bone before this. So this was. 9-11-2012, so it was kind of a, toward the end of the season uh, that particular year. Uh, and then we went to the off season, and this is what it looked like when he had increasing pain. And here. Looks like it's fractured. <laughs> and, then, and then now this is a, a year later. Well, now I, I really don't see any articulating cartilage um, along that entire lateral trochlea, and it, it just goes straight to the subchondral yeah. bone plate right there. Yeah, <clears throat> a lot of the bone injury. And this this is actually progressive uh, uh, injury to the knee. And uh, at first I thought when I looked at that middle one, I thought he had had some sort of surgery, but he had just been uh, uh, ongoing exercising, trying to get back in shape. For the next season. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, he didn't do well. Here I see some 
just diffuse grade two chondral thinning, and then there's also some deep near full thickness fissuring there along the femoral condyle, probably close to grade four. So it looks like there's a focal grade four chondromalacia full thickness defect of the posterior weight bearing femoral condyle. And it also looks like involving the tibial plateau mainly, or that might just be how it's winded or cut. Uh, but it's, yeah, so we can see that femoral condyle defect better on the T2. So, uh, just remember, getting back to what John was talking about earlier, uh, when you look at these lesions, this is a nice discrete one. Uh, but what the surgeon wants to know in treating these lesions is if you go in there and you de debreed all of the dead cartilage around the periphery, how big is the lesion you're left with that you have to treat? So, uh, uh, so you basically then need to measure in uh, two dimensions. Uh, where you go from from basically normal cartilage to normal cartilage on either side. Now this one is pretty discrete, so there's not a big difference. But if you have a lot of abnormal signal intensity within the cartilage, uh, and you have to remember if it's abnormal cartilage, they're going to debride it first, and so you have to measure to normal cartilage, and that's often uh, much larger than what uh, people often say with uh, MR because people tend to want to measure the size of the lesion as it's in situ, but you have to remember what's really important is how big is the lesion going to be after they debride it, which is often important. Oh, what this looks like, uh, uh, John, is um, and, and that posteriorly, uh, uh, the, the, the cartilage looks like it's intact and, and adherent to the bone, but uh, anteriorly, uh, that looks like it can peel off um, uh, quite a bit, yeah. and then that's what happened. Uh, happens arthroscopically. Uh, you look at it uh, on uh, MRI uh, imaging, um, and uh, things look uh, like up to a, a centimeter. You get in there, and you get two centimeters. Yeah, uh, it's just a um, uh, you, you can't do it. You just cannot predict. Good. And, uh, and and it's important to know how how big the uh, the lesion is. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk a little about that when we get to treatment. Different. Kinds yeah. Of I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, good. Good, John. Great. Anyway, we have some uh, chronic grade four here on the, the patella full thickness, and just a bone scan showing the increased uptake there. Again, grade four, full thickness defects, a lot of bony irregularity, and the lateral facet of the patella. And just more, again, disease, full thickness, uh, grade four disease. And you can see these with low field. We don't see it nearly as well. So uh, high field imaging is really much better for the articular cartilage. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so 48 year old with six months of pain and no medial meniscal tear. Um, just looking at the cartilage here. Um, looks like, okay, so the ACL is intact. Um, I think we're looking at the patellofemoral articulation. It looks a little swollen. Maybe the articular cartilage has different signal strength. There's some deep fissuring and fraying. Oh yeah, that's definitely abnormal um, as we go through the slices here, but on the, on the, on the other one, it looked fairly normal. So this is a three millimeter thick skip one, and this is a 1.6 millimeter contiguous slices. So again, uh, uh, th those thinner cuts really are allow us to see the cartilage uh, better. Okay, uh, let's see, Jennifer, what do you think of this one? So here I see grade four chondral loss along the central aspect of the central femoral trochlea. We can see that gray line on the coronal images kind of disappears and turns into fluid signal intensity. Uh, 
Uh, I'd either call this grade three or four. Yes, and there's a small subchondral osteophyte. In this case, where they want to rule out meniscal tear, we can see a full thickness defect here on the thicker cuts. On the thin cuts, we can really see the size of the lesion uh, much better. And then uh, here's just more of a chronic chondromalacia of the trochlea with a lot of bone marrow edema from current use in subchondral cystic changes uh, in that area. Typical location for a trochlear injury. And this is what it looks like arthroscopically, all this kind of crab meat tissue of the articular cartilage. And then when you debreed it, it turns out to be a much larger lesion. And this was grade four. And further grade four chondromalacia, more chronic grade four chondromalacia. So I guess we don't. And then okay. Can you? Um, yep. Uh, is is one of the treatments for if it if you just have grade four chondromalacia but you have no injury to the subchondral bone, um, can you still put in an osteochondral plug? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, you can use any technique on uh, any lesion. It just uh, um, historically um, from. Um, Various uh, uh, papers um, that, that have been written. Um, one one uh, type of system is better than another for different lesions. Uh, it, and 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 there's a, a lot of uh, discussion as to uh, who's better at, at what and how. Um, and some. Uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, like one uh, technique and uh, others uh, choose another technique. Uh, and then uh, there are certain uh, um, rules and regulations as to which you should use at the size of the lesion. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, people pay attention to that. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I, I never did. I I, I liked the technique, and I, that's what I used. Uh, so, question: Can marathon running improve knee damage of middle-aged adults? Um, does that mean like you actually see? Um, I'm assuming the answer is going to be yes. Because if the answer is no, we wouldn't be asking. <laughs> They took 82 healthy adults, and they had. I can't. I can't hear you in the mic very well, John. They had uh, an MR scan six months before their first marathon was scheduled. 71 completed a four-month uh, training course and the marathon, and then they had a repeat MR uh, two and a half weeks or you know, two two weeks after the marathon. Was there uh, like? You know, is there exclusion criteria that you remember, like how extensive or healthy, normal, healthy adults? Okay. Uh, any idea what the results were? We talked a little bit about this study before. Well, I mean, I yeah, I assume they did have improved degenerative changes. I would have guessed that if you did this kind of training, they would make degeneration worse. You'd get more uh, edema and you get more tearing and loss of articular cartilage. That's what I would have guessed. So what they found was they had significant improvement in the subchondral of bone edema scores, which means that the, uh, the patients that were just sitting around uh, not doing running at this particular time, and these were all non-runners, by the way, uh, had a lot more bone edema than they had two weeks after they, they ran a marathon. And I would not have guessed that that would have been the case. And it was a very significant improvement in bone marrow edema score. Uh, uh, everything was better except uh, some of the patients had increase uh, in cartilage loss in the lateral patellar cartilage. And that seemed to be the, the main uh, negative that was statistically significant. And then the, 
that they had a little bit of uh, tendon of some of the strains, the menisci were fine. So the results is uh, uh, even, even though they had some increased cartilage loss of the patella, it was not symptomatic. And they found that there was no increase in these symptoms. And uh, the uh, result of the study was that long distance running may improve osteoarthritis in middle-aged uh, adults. So I think we need a lot more studies to understand what's going on here, but it kind of goes along with the uh, use it or lose it kind of philosophy. How about the guys that fell, John? The guys that fell? Yeah. I, I, I don't know about any that fell. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the other thing to notice, I mean, there, there are a lot of issues with this particular paper, one of which is uh, that uh, 11 of these patients did not complete it. They dropped out uh, during the training process. So it could be that those were people who ma made it worse, but because they had symptoms, they dropped out. So uh, uh, that, that, that's a very sizable number, which could uh, be an issue with, uh, with this particular paper. So, and just like just like the recruits in a service, some develop um, um, stress fractures and yep. uh, some don't. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure it, um, why. Yeah. So let's look at some acute injuries. Now, when you have an acute injury to the articular cartilage, you can get delamination or a separation of the of the articular cartilage at the calcified zone next to the bone. You can develop flat tears, full thickness defects, so hole defects, or you can get osteochondral injuries where you injure the underlying bone itself. Or as you know, you can get chondral injuries without, I mean, you can get bone injuries without having uh, cartilage injuries. Uh, so this was a, a, a young woman who had uh, uh, an acute injury to the knee and came in. Uh, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Ashu? Yep, sorry. Um, sorry, uh, we're looking at the axials and sagittal view of the knee. I see quite a bit of uh, bone marrow uh, abnormality along the uh, medial and lateral aspects yeah, of the knee, yeah. both sides there. Yeah, all four. That's just that's just imaging the growth plate. Okay, okay. And then there's some delaminating injury. I thought of the trochlear of the trochlea there. I see a discontinuity with the articular cartilage. Okay, so you see a full thickness fissure here. But yeah. What do you see here? Yeah, I think it, it's it's kind of separating. I think it's delaminating right. off. Yep. Yeah, it's delaminating, and if you see that there's plastic deformity of the articular cartilage here, uh, as it as it gets stretched due to this injury, uh, so this this is a tough injury to to handle. It's hard to get the cartilage to stick back to the bone again. So a lot of these will end up being full thickness defects that have to be treated by other techniques. John. Uh, you can try to nail these back, but uh, I don't know what the success rate is at, in this level yeah. uh, where the patella comes in. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a, a lot of stress there with flexion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. So here it looks like there's some mild increased signal in the articular cartilage, but there's also a fluid signal intensity cleft undermining the subchondral bone plate. So this can be seen with an osteochondral injury. And here we see some edema in the lateral femoral condyle. So this may represent recent lateral patellar dislocation relocation injury. So this is kind of a glancing blow here and you have a delamination or separation again uh, at the base of the articular cartilage in this particular patient due to a uh, transient dislocation of the patella. 
So, so these are kind of delamination injuries. Michael, what do you think of this case? So there is a, uh, you know, completely removed, uh, like the medial trochlear cartilage is completely stripped off and now displaced into the intercondylar notch. Um, and there's probably just a little bit of indentation on the, the subchondral bone. Like maybe it's a little indented or impacted. And then there's some edema in the uh, femoral trochlea. I mean the femoral trochlea. So, so this is an acute injury with uh, displacement of a whole segment of articular cartilage. And uh, so sometimes you can try to put these back again, but as John was saying, uh, that tends to not work very, very often. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, I think we're too high up to see the trochlear cartilage, but there's a, I, I would say a deep fissure here of the lateral patellar uh, articulating cartilage right there. Yeah, and this is a shallow trochlear groove, a large lateral facet, and right, an acute uh, uh, articular cartilage tear. Jennifer, here's a T1 weighted sagittal image. Well, along the central aspect of the femoral condyle, there's some slightly increased or decreased T1 signal, and the cartilage looks thin there. Okay, and then here we have a full grade four chondral defect along the femoral condyle, and there's some delamination extending to the posterior weight bearing surface. This is a small region of delamination with a chondral flap. And in a situation like this, generally, these are treated by debridement and then either microfracture or osteochondral plug or uh, actually uh, the, the experience I've seen osteochondral plugs don't work great as I'll show later. Uh, now there there are their cartilage implantation techniques that I think uh, have greater promise. Uh, but this is an acute tear of the articular cartilage. What, what about this like um, kind of non-weight bearing rest? I'm sorry. What was just like, rest. Rest. Yeah. Well, rest, but the articular cartilage isn't going to heal on its own. Okay. Here's the key. Okay. So I guess on the first T1, we don't really see too much, but then on the um, stir, we see a. Uh, a decent size full thickness defect in the central lateral femoral condyle. Um, we can see it's kind of in the posterior weight bearing surface overlying the posterior horn on the sagittal image, and it looks like there's some, like, similar to the other case, there's some delamination extending posteriorly along the subchondral plate. Typically, these are, would be debrided, so the size of the lesion isn't from there to there. The size of the lesion would be from there over to there. And here's another acute full thickness injury to the articular cartilage. And when it's acute, you then have to look for the uh, for the defect. And you can see these in other areas as well. Uh, here, this is just a oops, uh, a defect in the articular cartilage here of the finger, right in here. It looks small there, but if you go arthroscopically, you can see there's a pretty big chunk of cartilage that's been knocked out here in this uh, finger. And then here's another uh, big defect from acute injury. I was always afraid to uh, use the probe and go further uh, and delaminate more. Uh, you never know how how um, secure that cartilage is. Yeah. Interesting, John. And so here's a more of a chronic uh, uh, osteochondral injury with an in situ fragment here. We can see the fragment looks like it's very loose, and we can see other debris of cartilage also elsewhere in the in the joint space. And there's another big uh, uh, cartilage uh, chunk lost floating around in, in the joint space. So these are more acute uh, osteochondral injuries, and this was obviously a, a patellar dislocation case. OK. 
Okay. Uh, if I may say, uh, at this point in time, I, my son was about 15 years old, and he was uh, uh, trying to play baseball. Uh, he, he never was very athletic, and uh, he took a swing at a at a ball and and and, and dislocated his patella. Oh, um, this uh, first first dislocation, and um, he had um, uh, over a dozen loose fragments in his uh, oh my in gosh. his knee. knee. Oh um, and I had a friend of mine uh, who was very. Uh, good at arthroscopy uh, and had a um, had an extra year of training and and, and um, he has no problem with the knee which is uh, interesting that's very good that's great it's a hell of a result my, my son is this was fit, at the age of 15 now he's in in his 50s yeah that's fair. And, and 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 he's fine. That, that's great. That's good. So uh, w why don't we stop here and we'll finish off the cartilage lectures then on uh, Monday and go back to the shoulder. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everybody.